This podcast is brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation. Our mission is to accelerate breakthroughs in life-saving research and empower people everywhere to conquer cancer. Welcome to Your Stories, a podcast where we hear candid stories from people conquering cancer. I am your host, Don Dizon. Until just 10 years ago, few people knew who she was, let alone the enduring impact her cells would have not only on cancer research, but on a full gamut of clinical investigations ranging from AIDS to polio, gene mapping, the effects of radiation, and more. Today, her name is synonymous with Black history and medicine, and though 70 plus years have gone by since her death, the story of Henrietta Lacks remains all too resonant and all too relevant for Black patients, not only throughout the U.S., but around the world. And yet, at the same time, many of our greatest healthcare discoveries over the past 70 years, and even still today, can be traced to the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks, a young Black woman who died of cervical cancer at the age of 31. She was just one woman among generations of patients whose cells were harvested without their knowledge or consent. Her cells, however, would give her a unique and unforgettable place in history as the source of the world's first immortalized human cell line. Here with us today is Dr. Clyde Yancey, a professor of medicine and the vice dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at Northwestern University. Dr. Yancey also sits on the board of directors of the Henrietta Lacks Foundation, which was founded in 2010 to assist patients and families who've been directly affected by research conducted using their biological materials without their consent. Annually cited among the top 1% of scientific authors worldwide, Dr. Yancey focuses much of his research on patient outcomes and health disparities. And today he joins us to highlight the historical and current realities of structural inequities in healthcare and medical research and the continuing need to foster equity for every patient. Dr. Yancey, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. Before we get started, let's hear where you are joining us from today. So, Don, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to work with the ASCO Foundation and to be a part of this conversation, Conquering Cancer. I come to you today from Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. But I also come to you with a host of lived experiences that really qualify the conversation we're about. I am a physician investigator. I do clinical trials. I've worked closely with the National Institutes of Health for many years. I am a student of health equity, the champion of diversity and inclusion. And a lot of those themes intersect directly with the story of Henrietta Lacks. This is an important story for us to promulgate. Yes, it is a part of Black history, if you will. But more importantly, it's a part of our society's history. It's a part of medical history. It is a landmark, if you will, that really helps society understand how we need to deal with the precious resource of human material that might give us insight into diseases and therapeutics. So this is really an important conversation to have and so very relevant to the cancer community. So thank you for the invitation. Yeah, and I think that's a fantastic setup, Clyde, regarding all of that. You know, I remember being in medical school and being in a lab and being introduced to HeLa cells, not knowing that that was a shortened version of a real person. You know, when you look at cells in a Petri dish or in a test tube, I never even imagined that they were traceable back to someone who actually walked this earth and lived a life. And so set the stage for us. Tell us a little bit about Henry Laxer's story and why HeLa cells are so significant still. So there were a series of disruptive moments that really brought me into the HeLa cell ecosystem and much closer to the story of Henry Lax. It started when I was serving as an appointed advisor to the director of the National Institute of Health, Francis Collins. There's a formalized committee called the Advisory Committee to the Director, ACD is in fact what it's called. And in the process of executing our work early in my tenure, it became evident that a notable scientific publication 
addressed a recent article utilizing the HeLa cells and actually disclosed in the publication the DNA of those cells, DNA that directly reflected on her descendants. An egregious invasion, personal health information, even though it was exquisitely detailed and scientific and almost obtuse for the everyday person, conceptually, it was a breach contract. We don't reveal personal health information in the public domain without permission in contemporary medicine. So that was the first disruptive moment. And that disruptive moment led to the necessity to establish a governing body that would oversee the use and the administration and the reporting of research with the HeLa cells. So the second disruptive moment was when the director said, Claude, I need you to be this committee. And so I go from being relatively naive to then being taken aback about disruptive exposure of personal information to now being part of the governing group, managing how the cells were used. But what a journey. I read the book by Rebecca Sklude, which was another disruptive moment, to really learn the personal story. And then was the crucible. And the crucible moment was serving on the board and meeting family members for Ms. Lax. At that point, it's no longer a story in science. It's no longer an operational issue for the NIH. It becomes a very personal human story. And to this day, I still engage with members of the Lax family. So that's the beginning of this story. Now I can take it to the next step, Don, because I think that for the person listening, there are three aspects of this story that are incredibly important. The first is the history. For the first time, there were explanted cells, cells removed from a human body, that whereas the usual expectation is that those cells die on the operating room table, the cells kept dividing. They truly were immortal cells. They truly maintained some capacity to continue to divide. And those original cell lines are still with us today. These really are immortal cells. That's incredible. Isn't that incredible? That's incredible. And remember, Henrietta Lacks did have cancer. So her cells have embedded with them the mutations, the changes that likely predispose her to developing cancer. Imagine how much information we can extract from that about what causes cancer. Move from the history then to this issue of equity and society, meaning it forced us to put the question on the table, who owns human tissue? And it was very clear, you own your tissue, I own my tissue, and nothing should be done with our property, in air quotes, without our permission. So that's the second part of this, the societal issue. The first part was the history. Second part was the societal issue. But the third part, which is so important, was one of the most significant depictions of the difference between healthcare for persons with resources, without resources, for persons of color versus majority populations, and importantly, for people that are poor and impoverished, regardless of their ethnicity or demographic, versus those that had access to care. So there are a lot of lessons to learn from this, which is another reason why this conversation is so vital. Right. And, you know, it, it brings back this, this sense Again, just, you know, with my first experience of clinical research is this idea that you were given these cells as a student with no context at all. And I remember, you know, contrast that to say anatomy lab where you were dissecting a body, but at the end of anatomy lab, you got to hear a full story of what that person was and celebrate their life with their family. That didn't happen with HeLa cells as a student we never got the background of where these cells came from. At what point do you think HeLa cells and the story of the woman, you know, when did that just come into the consciousness of medicine, of science, and of society? Or do you think they were all at the same time or were they all sort of stepwise that we actually gave voice that this came from someone and this came from a family? So like most things, it's not because there was some gradual upslope, some iterative awareness. There was an inflection point. And the inflection point was the book by Rebecca Sklude, The Story of the Immortal Cell Line. That really generated conversation. That really caused everyone to say, what's the story? You realize that's a true story. 
And at that point, there was, if you will, a kind of accountability to say, this was egregious by today's lens. We should be fair, though. When this occurred in the 1950s, there was no such thing as informed consent for anything, for any kind of research, even for procedures. Physicians did what they thought needed to be done. They studied tissue that they thought might provide some answer. And so we have to be fair to the history of this process, but realize that because of this experience, we now understand in quite clear terms the importance of, as you said, for the anatomy left, the anatomic gift agreement, so that we have permission to utilize those remains as an educational resource. And so now we have to seek permission to utilize not just extracted tissue, but even blood and serum because DNA is ubiquitous. It's in, if I had hair done, it would be in my hair. <laughs> so you've got to be clear that you're requesting permission to use human resources, human tissue for other things. But let's continue our conversation because there's so much more about this. Yes. And I, I, I am actually glad that you're bringing up the historical context by which the cells were collected. And it was a very different time. And I think that that lens is important, but it doesn't negate the disparities in care that have persisted and were present even then. But Getting back to the HeLa cells, you had mentioned the G HeLa Genome Working Group at the National Institute of Health, which you co-chaired. And from what I understand, they worked very closely with the Lax family to determine you know, how the HeLa genome sequence was made accessible for biomedical research. So what are some of the lessons that you think the research community could glean from that group and its engagement with the Lax family? So there are three lessons that emanate from the work we did with the NIH HeLa Genome Working Group. The first was the importance of transparency. There's no reason to be clandestine. There's every reason to be very clear, to state what the purpose is, what the intent is, and execute according to intent. The second thing is to be very purposeful. First word was transparent. The second word is purposeful. Why are you using the HeLa cell lines? What do you intend to pursue? What's your hypothesis? What do you hope to discover? So you move from that transparency to that purposefulness, and then you go to the very challenging part of accountability. If by chance there is a commercial application here, what do you intend to do with those resources? That generated a very different kind of conversation that we didn't have before. All of a sudden, there had to be a very clear discourse. There had to be some intentionality, and there was a reason for accountability. And I think it really helped to change not just the way we use the HeLa cells, but the way in which tissue repositories are used in contemporary life sciences research. And I think that's been a good thing. Yeah. And I think it is an important aspect, especially in the oncology world, as we build what's called these tissue banks of specimens from all sorts of folks. And, you know, we want to learn from them, but so much of that has to deal with not only the intentionality of the research you're doing, but it's also the consent process of what you tell folks who are willing to provide tissue for this bank and essentially what rights they continue to have and what expectations they can get. Here's another thing that's really, this excites me because you're through the lens of oncology. It is absolutely necessary that we have access to tissue to understand as much as we can about biology of cancer because of not only, but because in part at least of the HeLa cell experience, we are more at ease with allowing our tissues, if we have cancer, to contribute to this overall knowledge base to populate the repositories. Because we know from the HeLa cells, there's much that can be learned from just that one cell line. What happens when you have many different cell lines and many different kinds of tissue? And the collective good is then benefited by this aggregate knowledge from everyone's willingness to say, I understand that we have to be quite reasonable about how we utilize, reposition, repurpose human resources, but we also understand there's a greater good. So why not? Let's do that. And I think that's really been for the good in cancer by getting access to tissue and studying those tissues. And HeLa might have started. Yeah, I agree. But here's the thing that I come back to a bit. I think the experience with the Lax family and this 
ongoing consciousness that your cells can live on long after you've passed brings up this issue of trust in science. If it happened to Henrietta Lacks, what's to stop science and scientists from doing this to me? And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, especially when it comes to communities of color and those of us who may have a simmering distrust of science. How do you think this experience has been viewed by communities who have not necessarily been included in the advances and access to the advances in medicine? So Don, this really is the important part of the conversation. Because let's start at the beginning. Why is there mistrust? There's mistrust because at some point in our history, there must have been a misdeed. And in this case, the misdeed was the misappropriation of the HeLa cell line. That's an excellent point. Yeah. But you can include the Tuskegee experience in here as well. Point being is that culturally, we all have cultural memory, cultural recall. There was reason to be at least ambivalent, if not untrusting, of science at large because of these misdeeds. So let's establish that root cause. You and I both appreciate an often spoken adage. Trust takes a long time to build and virtually no time to destroy. And it takes a really long time to rebuild it. And so we're in that rebuilding process still to try to have sufficient trust that everyone feels at ease with the scientific process. But let's make that contemporary. Part of that tentativeness about trusting science is at least a contributor to why today's science doesn't completely reflect the input of everyone who might have those given diseases. Cancer does not discriminate. Everyone is at risk for cancer. But if we don't have genetic repositories, tissue banks, clinical trials that reflect the diversity of the individuals that have the disease, this is a very different kind of diversity we're talking about now. If we don't have the knowledge base necessary to really make the fundamental discoveries that will help all persons. And it's remarkable to think that this absence of contemporary information relevant for all persons with different kinds of cancer can be sourced to this history of mystics that fomented mistrust and now has led us on this really long, almost long suffering journey to reestablish trust, to get to where we can have the information we need to answer questions about all persons. So it's remarkable that the HeLa cell story is really at the nexus of so much of what we're still dealing with now in contemporary medicine. Yeah, and I think it's always worthwhile for our listeners to realize that everything that you have mentioned from HeLa to the Tuskegee experience, experiments, this is not historical context, so just that that was in the 1800s. I mean, Tuskegee didn't end until the 1970s. So this is still very fresh in a lot of minds of people. So remember, I'm on a foundation that supports the grandchildren of Henry Lex. This is very real. Very real and recent, yeah. So I guess, you know, one of the things, especially with your commitments to inclusion, as well as into equity, as well as equality. What do you think needs to happen and what has happened already to ensure that Black patients know that there is a conscious, intentional work at play to include them and represent them in scientific research? So, Don, let me start at a global position. Please. And then go to a specific position. I am really taken by my professional and personal experiences during the pandemic, it became eminently clear to everyone, and I've tried to articulate this repeatedly in the medical literature and in these kinds of conversations. The pandemic taught us that the absence of health in any one of us affects the health of all of us. And so from a global perspective, it really is necessary for us to take a universal approach in our study of life sciences and our dispensation of healthcare resources. So let's be very clear about that. That universality involves the way we execute our science. Who's enrolled in the clinical trial? Old, young, non-English speaking, English speaking, black, white, Latino, Latinx. We need to be inclusive necessarily, not morally, necessarily. 
so that we have the information necessary to answer questions. Now, if we take this to one particular cohort, people that self-identify as Black or African American, the litany of medical improprieties, the evident reality, health inequities, the stark disparities that still exist, as difficult as it is for me to articulate that, that still exist, require everyone to not just make acknowledgement, but to make effort. There's a difference between saying, I know this and I understand this, versus I'm going to do something. To do something is to invite others into a conversation. To do something is to change the demographic of those that are doing the research, the scientists, the clinical trial coordinators. To doing something is to have more representative patient populations and tissue banks. We can collectively make a difference here. Those persons that self-identify as Black or African American, me included, can step up and say, yes, I want to be a part of this clinical trial. Yes, you can have access to my material because it will help you understand something about someone else. But I want the benefit of the experience. That is, I want the transparency. I want to know your purpose. And I want to know that there's accountability somewhere. And I only want things done with my information or my resources or my tissue for which I've given permission. There is a way forward. And here's the other thing, Don, that we haven't talked about. In the era of Henrietta Lacks, it really was all about tissue and analog science, pen and paper. The world is very different right now. Today, the world is about proteins and DNA and about data. This is a very different kind of science we're executing. Incredibly powerful, but the issues about ownership and permission are even more important because science now moves at the speed of light. And so we need to set up a priori, what are the safeguards, what are the boundaries, so that we can keep everything by intention where it should be. And I think, you know, to that end, I think what's so inspiring about the the work that you're doing with the Henrietta Lacks Foundation is that the family remains involved in those conversations. And I'm just thinking about institutions where they are setting up these tumor banks, where we're setting up all these samples to be warehoused. How do we ensure that diversity of voices are at the table, though? And based on your work with the Lax Foundation, what advice would you give to institutions to ensure that representation is equitable? Advice point number one is listening, meaning that we as scientists don't begin the conversation and say what we wish to do. We as scientists reach out to those stakeholders, be they family members, friends, community workers, and say, what are your thoughts? What are your wishes? We should be clear, all of the models in which I've been engaged, whether it's the Lax Foundation or even the NIH Kela Cell Working Group, they are imperfect models. I don't know if any family, my own included, that is of one thought, of one voice, of one perspective on the issue. So we have to allow for how we as humans interpret circumstances and feel differently. The Lax family is no exception. But it is important that we listen, that we accommodate, that we acknowledge. One of the most important things we did with the HeLa Cell Working Group was to indicate that in any publication using the HeLa Cells, there must be an acknowledgement of the source of the cells. That in and of itself was almost a breakthrough. So that's the second thing. The first thing is that we have to listen. The second thing is that we have to acknowledge. When we make those two first steps, those are sufficient that they can actually shift the way we execute the science, the way we report the science, and importantly, the way we implement the science. That's really the necessary piece of this. But we have to account for the fact that we're trying to perfect imperfect models And we're trying to curate information that might at the source, that is at the family source, be quite varied. So it's very important, very important to listen. And a lot of people in my space with credentials like mine forget about the listening part. And part of this conversation is to encourage a lot of listening. Oftentimes, I think as researchers and, and certainly as, you know, center leaders, we listen to the voices who are most likely to fund us. And unfortunately, I think that limits the importance of community participation. 
because the community isn't where we're going to get the money. It's from the philanthropy. And I think there's almost this disconnect that the science and community don't meet, that you need to focus on the science because that's where the money is. But I think, Clyde, I think your point is so, so, so important for us is that the science builds on the community and the community has to inform the science. And only with those two really talking and collaborating together is philanthropy ever going to be successful. So let's take the point you made and let's for a moment accept the hypothesis. How do we incorporate the right voices around the table and change the way we do science? And this is referable to oncology. You correctly pointed out that we should hear the voice of those that are funding the research. And you and I are both agreeing that we should hear the voice of those impacted by the research. But here's a thought experiment. As you go about your everyday, Don, to whom is it that you give the most time and attention when it's time to listen? It may be your significant other. It may be the person you recognize as your boss, your manager, your director. To whom is it that you give less time to? Is it that younger person? Is it that person not like self? Is it that person that subconsciously makes you feel a little ill at ease? What I'm getting at is that we have to assiduously manage our biases because our biases incline us to give one voice more attention and more credence and one voice less. So we are compelled to listen to the folks that pay the bill. We're compelled to listen to the people that employ us or the people with whom we have an overt relationship. But what makes us special, particularly in this space of executing good science, are we willing to navigate our own biases and listen to the unheard voices, listen to the voices on the perimeter, listen to the voices that may be inarticulate, that may be awkward, that may be unrefined, but may have a powerful message to deliver. That's how we do better science. I think that is just a wonderful way to explain how biases may, even without us realizing it, how they inform our work and how we need to be conscious of that and cognizant of that. I think that was just quite brilliant. I 100% agree with you on that. So moving towards the other issue that is so relevant to this conversation, especially as we try to navigate a more equitable future for everyone, no matter where they live, is to look at the workforce organizations such as the American Society for Clinical Oncology, is very interested and feels it is a very high priority to diversify the workforce. And specifically, I think, you know, to ensure that communities of color are represented, not only in the, you know, in the roles as research assistant or lab technician, but as principal investigator, as physician, as clinical trialist, So my question to you, given the vast experiences that you've had and the fact that you are a mentor, not only to Black Americans, but also to everyone who's interested in doing really good science, what do you think stands in the way between society and achieving a diverse workforce? And how do you see progress being made in increasing that diversity? So very quickly, We have to take our consciousness away from the short-circuited definition of diversity. It's not just a euphemism for Black or Hispanic or LGBTQI or any other protected group or underrepresented group. That, unfortunately, is a product of our, if you will, more shallow thinking. I see usually these one-dimensional thinking. Yes. I think what we have to realize is that the kind of diversity that we're talking about vis-a-vis the workforce and science is the diversity of thought, the diversity of ideation. We need good ideas. I'm talking to the cancer community. You better believe we need good ideas to figure out what's the path we haven't pursued, where might there be an answer that we haven't considered, how can we get the right candidate ideas on the table so we have the best opportunity to discover the next great direction, cancer care. That doesn't come from sameness. If everyone around the table is exactly the same, you get the same thing. How many times have you been in a meeting and someone says, well, I agree with what's just been said, 
Well, I was going to say the same thing, but let me just embellish that a bit further. That doesn't tell me anything new. That doesn't get me any further. What I want is a person who says, I have another idea. Think of the power of that. I have another idea. So the lay world, the political expedient community wants us to think about diversity as approximation for race and ethnicity. That's not anywhere near the relevance it should be as it is today. What's important is a diversity of thought, diversity of ideation. We need different ideas and we only get different ideas by reaching out to different people. Now, let's get away from that statement because that's, again, one of my, my favorite discussion topics because I think diversity and inclusion gets conflated with something that is approximated to a race-based or ethnicity-based conversation. And that's Yes, I agree. And that's a mistake. Yeah. But let's talk about the workforce. If we are to change the way in which we pursue what I like to call discovery science, then to discover us, to be very clear, need to have the latitude to consider hypotheses and directions that we haven't said it before. So for discovery science to thrive, the discoverers need to thrive. And for those professionals to thrive, there needs to be a whole lot of color around the table. And I don't just mean black, white, and brown. I mean every possible color that's giving every possible perspective and reasonable people sit back and say, that was a good idea. That's the direction we'll pursue. Yeah, and I think one of the words I reference, because I do believe that if you look at the way we do epidemiology, so much of what the outcomes are stratified by is really one dimension, whether it's be race, whether it be income level or even education. You know, this idea that we need to get to a place where the representation at a table is intersectional is so, so critical that none of us exist in just one dimension. None of us, our character, our experience, our intellect is not determined by any one part of us, that we are these complex characters. And until we look at that intersectionality, as it comes to listening, as it comes to contributions, I think we will be limited. So I love this idea that you're you're making that, you know, it's diversity of ideas comes from the diversity that's experienced at the tables. What have you seen though, in terms of inspirations that will get, let's say a diverse group of people interested in pursuing medicine, clinical research and science? If you look at just within oncology, for example, our workforce is in the single digits when it comes to underrepresented minorities in the field. And we are seeking to change them. In your vast experience as a leader in medicine, have you seen outreach efforts that have been particularly successful? So several responses. First, my experience, particularly with the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, I was part of the group of professionals that established PCORI and on the pioneering methodology committee at its outset. What was so incredible was our mantra, research done differently. We went to the persons with the condition first and used that to source the ideas. I'll never forget those conversations with people who actually had the disease who were telling me, these are the questions I want you to answer. So that experience says, that's not just a one-off. That's a new way of doing business and we should continue to follow through. So in the oncology community, we should sit down and talk to black men with prostate cancer. What are your questions? What are your concerns? We should talk to black women, young black women with familial breast cancer. What are your challenges? What are the issues? That's how we become better informed. So that's my experience. Second, I am uplifted by science. What is so notable, despite all the political rancor, all the social disruptions, Guess what? Very quietly, science has been this locomotive train. It stayed on the track. It's continued to progress. We are learning more and more. We have more different ways to understand diseases, more different ways to understand therapeutics. Just the natural progression of science necessarily will answer questions that will have an influence in everyone. So my experience tells me that there's a different way to do things. My embrace of science shows me 
that is going to happen. But there are two other things that are very important. I will not let this conversation about health equity last. We will persist with this conversation. It will be part of the narrative going forward. It will be in everything we do in science, in our research, in our publication, in our implementation. We will constantly remind investigators, funders, everyone who's involved in the life science enterprise, we have to be cognizant of equity. So that is another point. And the fourth point is this. I am so emboldened by the next generation. The next generation doesn't know the same scars that I know being a child of the 60s. The next generation sees each other as other social beings. The next generation doesn't say why, they say why not. In my generation, we said why. Why am I treated differently? Why are things not the same in South Side Chicago and downtown Chicago? This current generation says, why not? So you think about the experience of seeing things done well, but done differently. You think about this embrace of science and the progression of that locomotive I'm talking about. You think about this incessant mention of equity. We relentlessly keep this on the table. And then you empower this next generation who are not about the whys, but the why nots. I really look forward to a future with a lot more optimism. I don't know what that timeline is. That timeline may be a full generation or half generation. And we're always exposed to the disruptive, abrupt discoveries and the calamitous events as we've just seen. But I really invest in humanity, really invest in science, and have a belief that we will follow an arc towards health equity as time goes on. Well, I hope our listeners find you as inspirational as I do, Clyde. One final question for you. Conquer Cancer is heavily focused on raising money for research and other vital programs that affect people with cancer and their families. How can organizations like ours continue to ensure better, more equitable care for communities of color and specifically for Black patients and to ensure they're included and represented in the research that so deeply affects their lives and the lives of those that they love? Let me give you a contrarian answer. Let's start and stop with conquer cancer. And let's remember that the same risk factors lead to cardiovascular disease, the field in which I have my experience and expertise lead to cancer. So let's conquer cancer in a very disruptive way. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's prevent cancer. We know there's certain lifestyles or certain behaviors that predispose to cancer. Not genetics are what they are, but we can learn more about genetics as we go. And you and I both know about yep. a phenomenon of epigenetic factors, which involves intersectional health and society. That's another podcast, okay? <laughs> but let's take concert, conquer cancer and go to prevention. Bang for the buck, benefit of intervention, a reduction in both the cancer burden and the cardiovascular burden and the cognitive dysfunction burden. Boy, now we're talking about something very powerful. We want to empower our communities of color, maintain their health, and allow their economic enterprises to flourish. There is no greater luxury in life than health. Yeah. More than wealth, it's health. So that will we conquer cancer. Let's restore health in those Black communities. Yeah, and I think that's one of the movements in oncology is you know, the attraction of precision therapies, finding out what our genes are telling us, finding out what those mutations are doing. And certainly it's been such an exciting time compared to when I started in oncology to see, you know, trajectories of cancer and its natural history changed with the development of these precision therapies. But there is still so much work to be done outside of the expensive technologies and the precision therapies and individualized care. And yes, yeah. And I think if you want to reach a population that hasn't been diagnosed with cancer, but who are at risk for that and other medical ailments, including cardiovascular disease, the old adage still holds true, doesn't it? The amounts of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> so let me give you two closing thoughts. I want to develop this visual image for our listeners. Think of a bookcase. It's got bookends. In this conversation, one bookend is this incredible discovery of precision therapies that give us the opportunity to treat cancers better than we've ever treated them before. But if that other bookend isn't in place, then the books fall down. That other bookend is prevention. If we take the prevention piece 
full on, but we don't think about the therapeutic piece, the books fall down. We have to have both bookends for the bookshelf to remain stable. So I think that analogy really captures what you and I are talking about. And all in between is everything that you and I both know about the clinical practice and the discovery of oncologic illnesses. But I'll leave you with this thought about us as physicians. There's an incredibly important Chinese proverb that sits on my credenza. It says, the mediocre physician treats diseases, saves lives. The good physician thinks about risk and treats conditions. But the great physician prevents risk and prevents disease. So let's think about our greatness. That's the message. Sage words. And I think it's a perfect place to end this. Thank you so much, Clyde. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation. Conquer Cancer is creating a world where cancer is prevented or cured and every survivor is healthy. You can make a gift at conquer.org forward slash podcast. The participants of this podcast report no conflicts of interest relevant to the contents. Full disclosures can be found on the episode page on conquer.org. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.